And I'm by my ex, this is Will, and we're going to be talking about the principle of hitchhiking in the distribution of autonomic nerves of the head and neck. So, uh, just what we're going to be going over. First, we're going to be talking about what we mean by the words hitchhiking. Um, then we're going to be going through how sympathetic and how parasympathetic nerves hitchhike uh, to get to their target tissues from the central nervous system. We're going to run through two examples of how parasympathetic nerves get there and then talk about some of the syndromes, some of the symptoms that can happen when things go wrong. Okay, so what do we actually mean by hitchhiking? Uh, it's just the means by which the parasympathetic and sympathetic neurons go from their origins in the central nervous system and get to their target tissues. So just talking about the parasympathetic system first. Uh, we know the parasympathetic nervous system has craniosacral outflow. So, the parasympathetic nervous system, the fibers originate in the four nuclei within the uh, brain. So, what we mean by nuclei, just like a ganglion, it's just a collection of cell bodies, but instead of being in the periphery, it's in the central nervous system. So, there's four ganglion uh, from which the parasympathetic fibers leave. And immediately after that, they'll travel with the cranial nerve to the ganglion, where they'll synapse and then move on to their target tissue. And uh, we'll go through the details in a minute. Just to contrast this to the sympathetic nervous system, obviously the sympathetic outflow is the upper lumbar, and for the head and neck it's only from T1 to T6. So clearly we're not going to have any cranial nerves in the thorax, so instead of hijacking onto cranial nerves, instead sympathetic fibres use arteries, uh, so they'll travel out and then move along from there using an artery. We'll go into that in more detail in a minute, but first we're going to have a look at some more details of the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, so as I said, there are four nuclei. Uh, we're not expecting you to like, know all the details of this, I don't think you'd have to either. Uh, this top one, Will's going to go through in a minute, it's the one we touched upon last week. Um, I'm just gonna go, he's going to go through in a minute, so we'll go through this third one down here. So, the third, the third nucleus that parasympathetic uh, fibers come out of is the inferior salivatory, and these are the ones that serve the parotid gland to cause salivation. So immediately after leaving this nucleus in the central nervous system, they will hijack onto the glossopharyngeal nerve, or they hitchhike along the glossopharyngeal nerve. So they're really closely related anatomically, and as soon as they come out, it's going to travel along towards the otic ganglion, just behind the parotid gland. That's where it's going to synapse, and then postganglionic fibres are going to go onto the parotid gland and cause salivation. As I said, we'll go through these in a minute. That top one should look a little bit more familiar. So, to contrast that with the sympathetic innervation, sympathetic fibers, as we said, come from the thorax, T1-6. They come out into the cervical chain, as we know, the sympathetic nervous system has a short pre fibers, so they just get a little distance out of the central nervous system. Then they're going to synapse in the cervical ganglia, and then hijack on arteries. So, there are three cervical ganglia, and each cervical ganglia has a respective artery, which it will use to hitchhike its postganglionic fibers along. So the superior cervical ganglion uses the carotid arteries to send the postganglion fibers up, the middle cervical ganglion uses the inferior thyroid arteries to send the fibers up, and then the inferior cervical ganglion uses the vertebral arteries. So just as a summary, parasympathetic fibers use cranial nerves, whereas the sympathetic fibers use the, uh, use the cranial nerves. Sorry, artery, yeah. Um, and so we're just going to go through a few of the examples for you. So this is the one that you might uh, be a little bit familiar with, the oculomotor nerve. So um, on the diagram here you can see the, uh, the nucleus that I was just talking about, the parasympathetic nucleus, uh, with the parasympathetic fibres running in blue here. And you can see they're very close to these oculomotor uh, fibres. Um, so it's hitchhiking along and they run together uh, through the lumbar fissure towards the orbit. And then you can see, uh, like you know, they split into... Uh, the ocular motor nerves go to elevate your extraocular muscles and then parasympathetic fibres will go to your uh, papillary sphincter. And also in green here you can see the sympathetic fibres coming up, like Eric said, following the arteries coming up, um, also going to the papillary sphincters. Um, so let's talk about some things that can go wrong, clinical relevance. The first lesion I'm going to talk about um, is Aedes pupil. So this is a, a lesion which is uh, before the ciliary ganglion, 
and uh, it affects either parasympathetic fibres or it affects parasympathetic and rocker motor, depending on which kind of um, what the cause is. So, a uh, cause that would only affect the parasympathetic would be something like a bacterial or viral infection, uh, whereas something that would affect both would be maybe a tumour or a raise in intracranial pressure. So what would you see clinically? Well, your sympathetic fibres are fine, but your parasympathetic fibres will not be working, they will not be affecting the papillary sphincter. So you would have unopposed sympathetic action at the pupil, which would lead to permanent dilation of the pupil. Um, depending on whether or not the oculomotor nerve itself is affected, you could also have the uh, down and out clinical sign if the extraocular muscles are affected. Um, and you would have partial ptosis, uh, drooping eyelid. Uh, the sympathetic fibres to the eye also elevate the superior tarsal muscle, which is why you only get partial drooping of the eyelid. And then the next one that we thought was Horner's syndrome, which you're probably familiar with, but that's a lesion of the sympathetic fibres uh, to the pupil. So you would see um, unopposed parasympathetic action at the pupil, so permanent pupil constriction. Um, you'd also have partial ptosis, like I said, because of the superior tarsal muscle, and then you also get um, anhydrosis for loss of sweating. Another nerve that you might not be so familiar with is uh, the hitchhiking uh, to do the facial nerve. So here we see the superior salivatory nucleus with the parasympathetic fibres coming out of it, and hitchhiking along the uh, facial nerve, cranial nerve 7. They follow a branch of the facial nerve, the uh, corda tympani, which actually itself uh, kind of hitchhikes along, as you see here with cranial nerve 5, the uh, lingual branch of the trigeminal nerve, in order to get to the submandibular ganglion and then elevate the sublingual and submandibular glands. So if you have any kind of pathology affecting this, these parasympathetic fibres, you would notice a lack of salivation or decreased salivation, but also depending on the, uh, the area along the course of which is affected, you could also have damage to the facial nerve and maybe even the trigeminal nerve. Um, that's it from us, so if you've got any questions, please ask. <laughs>